Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox. I'm the Compliance Evangelist, and I'd like to welcome you to a special five-part podcast series I recently did with John Gill, the Vice President of Education at the Association of Certified Fraud Examiners, the ACFE. In this five-part series, we take a look at five different fraudsters looking at the frauds they engaged in, how they were able to do so, and what led them to getting caught. We use this as an exploration for the compliance practitioner and the fraud examiner to detect and prevent fraud in their organizations. We take a look at Nathan Mueller and the Fraud Triangle, Mark Whitaker, Tone at the Top, Andrea Baxendale, Unfair Treatment Can Increase Risk, James Brandolino, Doing Your Due Diligence, and James Gromazek, What is an Insider Trading Crime? It's a fascinating exploration of fraudsters and, more importantly, the lessons that you can learn from them. John Gill has a wide and lengthy history with the ACFE and in education. I know you will find this special series worthwhile. This special five-part podcast series on fraudsters is a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox, back for another episode with John Gill. Vice President of Education at the ACFE. Today, we're going to take up the uh, case of Andrea Baxendale and how unfair treatment increases risks. John, uh, first of all, welcome back, and thank you for taking the time to visit with me today. Thank you, Tom. Appreciate it. Um, yeah, the last two were, were kind of multi-million dollar frauds, but I, for the average uh, fraud examiner, they may not uh, see millions of dollars in, in fraud in, in some of their cases. So I'm, I'm going one with that's uh, more typical today, uh, a woman named Andrea Baxendale. And I interviewed her uh, after she had been released from federal prison in uh, Terre Haute, Indiana. So Andrea had started with this. It was a smaller uh, company. It was a manufacturer, family-owned manufacturing business. And so she'd started just kind of low level as a clerk and the family liked her. And so they actually paid for her to go to college and, and get uh, her degree in accounting. So she was working as kind of a, uh, an assistant in the accounting department. There was an older gentleman who was the controller and he handled and paid all of the bills and was in charge of all the finances. Well, after she'd been there, Oh, oh, probably 10 or more years, this gentleman retires. And so they come to Andrea and they say, all right, we're going to give you the same responsibilities as as he had, but we're not going to pay you what <laughs> they were paying him. Now, they gave her, they didn't even give her the title, they called her chief accountant, and he was the controller, but she was doing all of the same uh, duties that he was. And so she thought, well, I'll, I'll do this for a while and then they'll see how, what a good job I, I do. And then eventually they'll, you know, give me more money. And it's like, well, that didn't happen. And so it just started to, to eat away at her to a certain point. And she's like, you know, this isn't right. I'm doing the same job as this guy did, and they're not paying me. And so she just decided she was going to even the score. So she just starts writing checks to herself. And she did that for uh, about two or three years to the to the tune of she stole about $400,000. And eventually they caught her, and she, she did serve a prison sentence. And so when I was... Um, doing the interview with her, I really wanted to kind of to, to drill down on, on what she was thinking and how this all, all started, because before this, she had done nothing. I mean, she was, you know, had, uh, was a loyal employee. She came in every day. She was uh, and liked the management, uh, thought they respected her. But then when they put her in this position, they didn't pay her uh, what she was, uh, what she thought she was deserved, and what the the, the man uh, was making before. That's when she started to steal, and she said that was that was the reason. If they're not going to pay me what I'm, I deserve, I'm going to have to take matters into into my own hand. And so that's how I, that started. So it made me think again. It's there's a, a difference between 
well, was that was she justified in doing that? Well, absolutely not. You're never justified in committing fraud. But uh, one thing that fraud examiners and compliance people are responsible for is is looking at an organization and trying to assess well what is what is their risk of fraud and there's a lot of literature on there and and, and courses and, and books and everything that have been written on but one of the, the things is looking at the the culture of the organization and how it operates so one of the things there is <clears throat> do people perceive themselves as being treated fairly and equitably, equ- equitably. If you have problems like this where you know men are making more than women or certain groups are making more or there, there are disparities in the salary structure, then you're going to have a higher risk of fraud. I, I think that's just a fact. That doesn't mean that people are going to steal it's certainly not right that they do it, but it is a trigger point that people that eventually will, you know, put up with so much, and then they might start uh, taking matters into their own hands. So that's one of the the things that that I think when you're you're looking at an organization that you as you're doing, and there are many tools for doing uh, risk assessments, but one is employee surveys and employee interviews, and so if you interview and you talk to people about how they feel about the organization and and management and if you if you start hearing well they're okay but they could do things better i don't think we're treated fairly or we don't they get these large bonuses and we get almost nothing it's like then you should that should at least be a, something on your radar that uh, at a certain point then the tide may turn they may take things in into their own hands that, so Loyal employees may not be as loyal as you think. They they thought that Andrea was, uh, you know, perfectly happy. One of them. They had absolutely no idea or any conception. Never thought that she might uh, steal because she had been there so long. And they made another crucial mistake. They gave her complete control of the accounting system. So again, this was a, a family-owned company. The owner was not involved. He was out there selling and he was um, manufacturing, and was not concerned at all with how the business operated. And so they told uh, turn that over completely to her. So she was the one who, when a bill would come in or an invoice to pay, that she would put it into the system. She was the one that uh, cut the check. Signed the check, sent the check off. She's one that balanced the uh, checkbook. She prepared the the balance sheets and the income statements, and so it was a, a recipe for disaster. So, all organizations, but particularly small to medium ones, have got to look at the system. And even if you think this person is the happiest, most contented employee in the world. You can't take that chance. You have got to have separation of duties. You cannot just put one person in control of the whole piggy bank. You, 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 it's setting yourself up for failure. And so many in other cases that uh, people I've interviewed, that's exactly what happened. The reason that they, they that perceived opportunity, they needed money. And then all of a sudden, uh, they realize no one is watching the bank account. I could write checks all day long because no one ever looks at it and balances things out. And she had, uh, on top of the rationalization, she had some some rather odd ones, I thought, was that um, she told me as we were doing the interview, she said, well, you know, I didn't think it was, they they really got, she, she was, Surprised they were so mad at her when this came out. And and she said, well, I don't understand that because I didn't steal the money from, from him personally. I stole the money from the company. And I asked her, I said, well, Andrea, I thought this was a, a, a family-owned company. In fact, I, I think the owner it was just the, the one individual was a sole, a sole shareholder. And said, well, yes, it, it was his company and he owned all the stock, but it was still, I stole it from the company. So in her mind, the fact that she stole it from out of a company checkbook rather than out of his his personal account 
was a difference, even though he owned all of the it was a, the sole shareholder uh, corporation. So I, that was uh, a, a rather odd to me that you could put up that that Chinese wall enough that you know you're taking out of this account rather than this account, and that somehow makes it okay. But uh, it 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 had a traded consequence. I think the pressure of all this and uh, uh, the owner. While the litig once they caught her, they prosecuted her criminally, and they also sued her in civil court to get the money back. And during this, the the owner actually had a heart attack and died, which then further alienated uh, the the family. And they really blamed her now for causing the heart attack. And she said that uh, she thought that was unfair that. Uh, that they blamed her for that because he had a bad heart to start with. So people can rationalize a lot of strange uh, things, but uh, don't think that everybody that works for you is uh, entitled to absolute trust. You really have to be careful. And John, the uh, it's a fascinating study of why institutional justice and institutional fairness are absolutely mandatory and how that um, component of corporate culture must be assessed from the fraudist perspective as well. Oh, absolutely. Uh, you, you just never know. You have to, unfortunately, just assume that every, you know, look at each each uh, person and say, could this person steal from me? And if so, how? And, and kind of go at it that way and not think, oh, well, no, this person's worked here for many years. They're they a great employee. There's no way they would ever steal. You have to, you have to assume the worst. So, John, unfortunately, we're near the end of our time, but uh, this has been a fascinating exploration of what uh, a different angle, perhaps, on what a company, uh, how a company can get into trouble with some some very basic um, controls as well. So thank you for uh, taking the time to visit with me today. And I look forward to tomorrow's episode where we take a look at James Brandolino. Thank you again. Thanks, Tom. Hello, everyone. This is Tom Fox again. Hope you've enjoyed this five-part exploration of fraudsters and the lessons learned for the compliance professional and the fraud examiner. If you'd like more information on the ACFE, check out their website, www.acfe.org. It's a great organization. You can get, certainly get a lot out of it. They're most helpful for the fraud examiner, for their compliance professional, or for the business profession. This five-part series on fraudsters with John Gill has been a special presentation of the Compliance Podcast Network.